Welcome to Uncharted Faith, a podcast from Trinity Church where we explore often difficult and deep questions of faith to find God's truth. Each episode is designed to expose areas of our beliefs and worldviews that might need to be remodeled, as well as those we need to affirm. This episode is the first of a series of discussions on love and truth, the, the concept of speaking the truth in love. We've invited guests Andrea Molina and Stephanie Ferris to join us for this conversation. And so we invite you to subscribe to Uncharted Faith so you'll get notified when future episodes release. We encourage you to share your questions, thoughts, comments with us either in the forums or through the email. And you can reach us at www.trinitychurchmorton.org. Let's join part one of Love and Truth. Our Uncharted Faith podcast. Uh, excited to keep these conversations going that we've that we've been on a journey on at Trinity um, over the last well, basically since the first of the year. Uh, we did our first podcast uh, the second week of January was when we released the first one, and uh, so we had our first conversation a couple of weeks before that. And Bill Vanderbush was our our first guest, and you guys have both met and and been around bill you know that once he started talking we got i think we had an hour and a half worth of content that i had to somehow fit into podcasts so we actually got three podcasts out of his his discussion so we'll see if you guys can do better than that um but uh tonight for those of you who are joining us i have two guests with me uh, we have Andrea Molina, who, who describes herself, I, I love this phrase that you gave me earlier, friend of the art community. Um, she is involved in music theater um, and developing and producing performing arts projects that heal, and I'm excited to unpack that a little bit. Um, and then our, our other guest is another friend of the house, Stephanie Ferris. Uh, both of you have been a part of Trinity uh, for a while now, and so... Our Trinity people all know who you are, but for those who don't, Stephanie is also now a pastor at Thrive Community Church in Athens, Texas. Uh, she's the growth and development pastor, and, I, and we were saying earlier that that's a nice vague title that allows you to do whatever you want to do, so that's, that's nice. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so again, to kind of give uh, the two of you an idea of where our journey has taken us so far, uh, we call this Uncharted Faith because we really wanted to deal with topics where there's not a roadmap or, uh, you know, really a guidelines for, for our Christian walk. Things where it's like, you know what, we really don't know how we're supposed to deal with these things because Scripture hasn't given us a map so much as a compass. And so how do we, how do we find our way through some of these um, deeper, uh, oftentimes difficult uh, components of faith and, and life uh, with Christ. And so uh, one of the things that's really a part of that for us at the very start was understanding um, the concept of the Christic covenant. And as people who've been a part of our conversations in the past, you both know what I'm talking about when I say Christic covenant. It's, it's that new covenant that God made with Christ that we get to be part of. And uh, it's very different from the Old Covenant, but one of the things that we've been unpacking lately is how even though the, the foundations, the underpinnings of the Christic Covenant are so different than uh, the corrupted Old Covenant, a lot of the things we do look the same, but there's something different. They produce a different fruit. And so, so we've talked about that a little bit with Bill and, and been developing that, but then coming out of that was this idea that, again, there was, and this was something I actually came to the conclusion of just in the last few days, I was kind of putting my thoughts together on how I was going to talk about Old Covenant versus Christic Covenant with you guys. And the Old Covenant, at first I said it was focused on right and wrong, but, but I realized that wasn't quite accurate. The Old Covenant was, there was glory on it. It was good. It was righteous. It was holy. The problem was not the Old Covenant. The problem was the corruption 
that humans brought to the Old Covenant. And that's what turned it into legalism and right and wrong and law and, and all of these things. It was, it was focused on wisdom, but it became focused in our human understanding on right and wrong. And when Jesus came, he came to bring, to bring a fresh revelation that, it's, that the covenant is not, the Christic covenant is not just about wisdom, it's about truth. And so in that kind of understanding that I was having, it colored a lot of what I want to talk about tonight in this discussion on love and truth. And so um, uh, that kind of brings us to this point of, of getting at this idea in, in the church in general, Christians in general have had a tendency to use this phrase, and it's a phrase that I can't stand. Um, even though it's scriptural, I feel it's so misused that um, it's actually offensive to me now. Uh, and it's that phrase, I'm just speaking the truth in love. I need to speak the truth in love. And we, we have typically used that in the past as a way of saying, um, you know, you're wrong and I'm right, and let me explain to you why. Mm-hmm. And what I want to kind of address tonight and and get you guys uh, engaged in a conversation around uh, what does speaking the truth in love look like in the Christic covenant? I think a lot of times when we say we're speaking the truth in love, that comes from a place where we've allowed that, that corruption of the old covenant into our new covenant understanding, into the Christic covenant. We've corrupted it a little bit. And I told, told uh, Bill during our conversation with Bill Vanderbush, there, there are a lot of things in my life where I feel like I have one foot in the Christic covenant and one foot in the old covenant, and I'm still learning how to recognize when that is and how to move so that I'm fully, firmly planted in Christ. And so um, I, that's kind of my conversation tonight, is how do we move ourselves to that place where when, when I'm interacting with people who don't share my values, don't share my, my beliefs, my understandings, um, how do I show them love and live out truth in their midst? And part of the reason we invited both of you is that you have both done this. Uh, you've invested yourselves in this in many different ways over the course of your lives. And so we've seen that, and we wanted to kind of get your feedback because I really want to get to the practicals of it. So my first question, I guess, would be... Uh, uh, when you hear the phrase, we need to speak the truth in love, or I'm speaking the truth in love, what are your initial thoughts or reactions to that? Cringe city. <laughs> I just cringe. And it's like, I just stop, and it's like my breath. I just hold my breath when I hear that phrase. Because what it's meant to me in the past is that I'm going to set a boundary. I'm going to tell you what I think is right. And until you can achieve what I tell you, you're not welcome inside my boundary. You can't cross that, that line. And that's, well, we can talk about what I think it is now, but that's what I, <laughs> that was what I grew up thinking it was. Right. So very restrictive. Yeah. It, 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 seemingly the opposite of love. Yeah, it's more of a shield. You deflect yeah. people with it instead yeah. of welcoming welcoming them. Yeah. All right. Good. How about you? No, I think that's I think that's right on, Andrea, because it's uh, in the past when I would hear that, for me even like personally, that would be probably a freedom issue that walls would go up because you're so fearful of what's going to going to happen in that mm-hmm. space, and it doesn't feel safe, and so then we have to be very careful as we try to use that same terminology. Um, and remember how we felt in those same positions. And so it's a it's an interesting uh, scripture that really can be wielded to hurt people in, in big ways. And that's okay. not what the Lord meant by any means. So so I called tonight love and truth is, is kind of mm-hmm. the topic. And so I kind of want to get at that concept of how do those two things work together in your mind? Where So... so um, I think the place to start is, number one, when we talk about truth, 
I, I think that there's a lot of different ways that that's uh, perceived, that word truth. Um, understanding what is truth, I think, is at the core of one of these problems. Because you mentioned earlier that it, it's when you hear that phrase, you hear somebody saying, I'm going to tell you what the correct standards are that you have to live up to. So, so in that case, that mentality would say truth is a set of rules or regulations that people need to, be, need to live by. Mm -hmm. And if they're not living by those, they're not living by the truth, right? But I think there's, I mean, um, I think that's one of the big struggles that people have. That, that's where that old covenant thinking starts to, to move in on us, is that we redefine truth to represent something it's, that it isn't. So I would love to hear how you guys would define truth now. Truth is the person of Jesus. <laughs> I'll just jump right in. And it's mm -hmm. for me, it's the it's the person of Jesus who who comes in in love. He doesn't come in abrasively, he doesn't come mm -hmm. in demanding his way. He comes in patiently, kindly, and and loves people right where they're at, right in their circumstance. And uh and, and that's that's truly what it is. It's this trust piece. I mean, I could go on and on. It's we need to we need to love and establish love and trust first before we can ever speak this truth that we're trying to carry because the the truth piece when it comes up will want to be deflected because of a defense mechanism. And that's what the world wants to do. We want to beat people up for what they're doing wrong so that they'll get in line and do it right and, it, and that's just not the way of Jesus. He came in with a love factor that was beyond mm -hmm. anything, and and he loves people um, where they can actually see the truth, and then the truth can set them free, and that's who he is. Love it. And oh, that's good. I mean, I agree with you 100%. Um, the, the thing I might tag on just from my experience is that in relate, I have to focus on relationship and love all the time. That's... Mm -hmm. um, and then I just let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit's going to do, because He's the one that's going to introduce the truth. Mm -hmm. And if it, if He asks me to prompts me to ask a question, and how's that working for you? You know, or is that working okay in your life? Or it yeah. seems like you're a little down. Or you know, just to gently lead after you've developed the relationship though and shown love in mm -hmm. that situation. Yeah. yeah, I love. So I I say it a lot to students that I, that I minister to or, or when I'm preaching, whenever. But I, I say a lot, you know, for the first time, when Jesus, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, for the first time, truth wasn't a set of principles or ideologies or, or uh, correct understandings or orthodoxy. Truth was a person mm -hmm. that we could get to know in an intimate way. Um, and, and, and in, in a relational way. And that's, that's a, a powerful uh, uh, perspective shift that takes place when we redefine truth in that way. The challenge, I think, is that there are things that are good, right, healthy, pure, holy, mm -hmm. right? And, and so it's easy for us to start to go, well, we know the evidence of Christ in someone's life is these changes or these transformations taking place. And so we want to see, tra I try to give people the benefit of the doubt as mm -hmm. much as possible. Um, I like to think that, that I'm still young um, and immature. And, and so, so I give people perhaps more, more uh credit than maybe I should, but I think a lot of times when people uh, begin to come at issues that, that concern them of issues of holiness or, mm -hmm. or right, uh, right doctrine or, or whatever it is that they're pursuing, right, and that they're trying to correct in someone else, they're coming at it truly from a, a desire to see someone in a better place, the problem is they come at it from a place of what I, of moral authority. I'm right and you're wrong, 
And so there's already a power dynamic in place that would say, I'm coming from a position of authority over you to say, this is what you need to think differently about, or this is what you need to do differently in your life. And that, what Stephanie, what you said, that's not how Jesus came. He specifically said, the Son of Man has not come to rule over, but to serve. Yeah. And, and there's, a, there's a very different tone and experience that people would have in that. And, and I think that's where that love factor comes in. And so, so I would say um, we've, we've kind of redefined truth and said, no, truth is not just this set of principles or ideas that we want people to agree with us on. <laughs> um, but, uh, but then there's that question of what is love? What does it mean to do things from a place of love? And, and what does that look like or, or how is that defined? So that would be my next question for you guys is what does that look like for you? How do you know, man, I'm doing this out of a place of love and not out of a place of I just want to be right? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, as I sit here and ponder it, um, it's no longer an obligation to change or, uh, you know, no one in our life should be a project. And when we actually love them well, we're wanting the very best for them. Mm -hmm. And so then those conversations come up where we can, we can come around a situation or we can come around a, a thought pattern. And, and even if we need to ask for that umbrella of grace, I used to use that term all, all the time. Just, I'm going to give, if you could just give me like, literally give me an umbrella of grace on this. Cause I'm going to, I want to say something and I want you to hear it. And we're just giving them a kingdom option to what is going on in their lives. And so that's who Jesus was. He was, he presented kingdom in, in every aspect. And it's, it really is like Andrea says, it's out of relationship. What happens is they trust you and no longer you, you're not a threat anymore because they know that, that I have their very best interest in mind and that I want the very best for them. And I would never want to wound them. And when we can get in that space, there's so much truth that can be spoken so sweetly. And, and that's when Andrea said, you know, you ask for the Holy Spirit because there's hard conversations sometimes that we need to have with people. And it's not that we want to change them and, and, and committed to loving them right where they're at. It doesn't matter if they change or not. I'm still, I'm still going to love you right where you're at. And, and that's what the Lord does. It's in his timing. And I think, I don't think we can dismiss the Holy spirit ever because actually as much as we want to change anything, we can't change anything. Amen. And we're not called to change someone and we're not called to be that we're called to be loved people and be the re presentation of Jesus. And, and so, I would want them to be so attracted to the love in my life that they want to be that, that they're, they're so safe in it that yeah. they'll ask you for conversations. Yeah. There's this shift again, you know, saying, I called it moral authority, moving, moving from speaking these things into someone's life from a position of moral authority to a position of relational investment. I, I just, mm -hmm. I want to invest in you because mm -hmm. I love you and I care about you. And, and that's what Jesus did for us, right? I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's that component of um, while we were yet sinners, mm -hmm. Christ died for us, right? And then, and then he said, and here's the gift. This mm -hmm. is the gift of God. And you can either choose to walk in it or not. And he left that up to us. And when we come, I think there's that point where when we're, we we're trying to speak to someone from a place of moral authority, where we're wanting them to, we're wanting them to make better choices and, and think better ways. Um, but we don't want to give them the opportunity to say no. <laughs> we really want, we, we really want to force that on them. And that's, that's kind of the best case scenario of speaking the truth from moral authority. Mm -hmm is I'm going to force someone to adjust their behaviors, whether their heart was transformed or not, right? But from that place of relational investment where the Holy Spirit has, has breathed life on it, transformation takes place 
on the inside, and then mm -hmm. something happens different with their actions and their and their thinking. And uh, so, so many, that's many times, Eric. I don't, I don't want to jump in, but many times they don't know why they're acting that way. Yeah. Like it's a manifestation of, of, of a pain, of a freedom issue, some kind of a trauma that's going on, something that they don't even have. They can't bear witness to it yet. They just, right. they don't have a vocabulary for it. They may not have any counseling for it. There may be nothing there, but it's, it's an outlier. And so we see these things that are happening and really it's, it's deep heart things. And so it's, it's really coming in and, and doing, helping them do heart inspections. It's not even corrective behavior management. That's not what it is. It's yeah. how's your heart in that? You know, just like Andrea said, how's that working out for you? Right? Cause there's a, there's a motive behind things. And when we can relationally get to those places of depth, the, the truth is, is such a sweeter sound to it. I think we, we make it sound rosy, though, for us on our end, that it's rewarding all the time. So I just, I just want to throw in the disclaimer that when you're walking with someone through their anger, mm -hmm. sometimes they'll take it out on you. But anger is just a mask for pain or some kind of hurt mm -hmm. in their life. And so for me, it's I've had to like grow up and just learn to turn the other cheek and just to be humble and just you know, love them through it and yeah. just realize this is not about me. Right. Don't take it personally. The Lord's just really doing some work right now and just to let it go. Just yeah. just ride with them through that storm. And then they come back. They, they, they do come back because they remember it. And then they go, why did you do that for me? Yeah. Just like we probably say that to God the Father. Why did you do that for me? Well, and, you know, Jesus on the cross. Exactly. Forgive them. They don't know what they're exactly. doing. Exactly. Okay. And that's, I mean, it's that, it's that, that kind of love uh -huh. that creates space for truth to have power, mm -hmm. right? Um, Paul said that the law was powerless in our flesh Be for exactly the reasons you're talking about. So, I mean, sometimes they don't know even what, so, so it doesn't matter how much correctness you give them mm -hmm. they don't have it within themselves we don't have it within ourselves mm -hmm. to make the right decisions because there's something twisted right there's something out of whack and the law is powerless to do that it wasn't until the love and the truth of the holy spirit came into the situation that suddenly there's power on whatever advice or, or correction mm -hmm. that's being brought. It, it only comes, the power isn't in the correction. The power is in the love. Mm -hmm. So the correction is, yeah, oftentimes worthless because it, 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 it just can't do the job. Um, and if it's pouring out of a vessel that is in an identity crisis themselves, then they're <laughs> looking for power in the situation. Yeah. So yeah. the power and love gets twisted, right? Yep. But Andrea hit it because she she said, "I've grown up in this area. I can turn another a cheek." And and again, um, when we when we try to use truth to control something, it it's a power move on our part, mm -hmm. and that's not holy at all. That's that's coming from a broken place of of needing control of a situation or whatever it is. And so that love factor, when we can just love without having uh, control without worried about the outcome. Yes, I'll pray for them, right? And and I'm yeah. concerned for their outcome. But it's my happiness or my position in life is not dependent upon their obedience to some truth that I've given yeah. them. That's that is the Holy Spirit's work. And so when we can when we can tandem work with the Holy Spirit in in releasing that love and that truth, then there's a there's a sweetness that comes over it that he has control and then and, and he makes the moves and yeah. we can walk away unoffended and still and still loving really well yeah there's there's that component of saying i value the person more than i value the correctness of their behavior mm -hmm. i'm going to be i'm going to be more uh more concerned with making sure that I have blessed and, and encouraged and built up and edified Absolutely. somebody uh, mm -hmm. than I am whether they're making the right choice 
after I, you know, whatever it is. So there's, there's that component, I think, that's that sacrificial love mm-hmm. that says, number one, it, the first and foremost thing on my heart is you. Just knowing that you know I love you, mm-hmm. period. And if, if I get to bring some correction, we'll deal with that when it comes. But the love is the primary thing. And so, um, and, and, and the correction flows, right? How, how often do you act, like if you're in a, a loving relationship with somebody, we, we've all had teenagers at some point that we've had to deal with, right? Where we love them to death but there's correction that has to be brought right and there's but there's that component of how do you do that in a way that um reinforces the love not the correction that that's that's where you know we get into the 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 processes um we all have people in our lives who man, you're making a choice that's just going to take you right off a cliff. Right off a cliff. And I love you too much to not say something, but I've got to say it in a way that doesn't drive you further off the cliff. Right? And so how do we... So so I would love to hear from you now, the practicals, because both of you have, have lived lives inside places, again, with people who are completely different value systems, completely different backgrounds and experiences and and um, beliefs and, and and all of that um, and I'm sure that you've had to try and bring some truth to a situation where your primary heart was for love and so I would love to hear your stories again names can be changed to protect the innocent but but I would love to hear stories that would say this is this is ways that this has worked for me in the past. The testimony of of that, or even ways that this hasn't worked in the past. I'm okay with those kind of testimonies too. I, just, you have any. I was thinking with teenagers, um, because I think the thing about being a teenager is you you really want freedom. If I remember those days correctly, and it's just the the stepping toward getting you know the wings and getting out of the house, and. Um, I think with mine, my kids would tell you that mom, she could just flip it and um, over the small things. She was just like loser marbles. But but they would tell you in the big things, I was as cool as a cucumber and I would just walk through it with them. I would say sometimes, are you sure you, are you sure you've thought through this decision? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, let's see how that works for you. And when it comes back and you just say, well, you know, that decision does have consequences, and you knew that that might be one. So you just walk through it with them. So, so what I'm hearing is you would flip out over the, the, the messy room. Yeah. But you'd be cool as a cucumber in the midst of... Shoplifting. You know, yeah, or shoplifting or whatever. Or whatever. goes on. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I had a, a certain insta- instance... Um, thing came up with my son and he got in some serious trouble and Scott picked him up and brought him home and I was in a different place so I had to I came home a little bit behind and um, I asked my husband how he dealt with it and I didn't necessarily come into agreement with uh, how that went down but what I did is I, I told Ryan to go collect himself and come back down and, and we'd have a conversation. So when we came down to the countertop and he explained, I said, tell me exactly what happened. So he just told me everything that happened. And uh, in that space, I'm, I'm going to stop the story for just a minute. That was on a Sunday. That morning I had been at church and one of the worship leaders immediately after worship bolted down the steps and grabbed me and said, no matter what, love. And I go, okay. And he goes, no. And he was just, he was super intense, like giving me this prophetic word. The Lord wants you to, he wants you to love no matter what, no matter what happens, love. 
no matter what happens, love. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, does this make any sense to you? And I said, well, Caitlin just got in a car accident and totaled the car yesterday. I said, I thought we loved her well through that. Maybe, maybe that's what he's trying to tell me. And so I, I just took the word for what it was. And then later this evening, that evening, this whole thing unpacked. And so when I come home, when I got the phone call for it, I knew exactly what I knew exactly what the Lord was trying to tell me to do. So back at that countertop, I'm sitting with him and he tells me the story of what happened. And I looked right at him and I go, well, that's, that is really odd. I said, because that's not who you are. And I said, that's, that's not the son that I know. And I literally just began to prophesy over him who he really was. Mm -hmm. And that there was just this absolute incongruence of who I knew he was and the behavior that he had just exhibited in the last few hours. And so that was a process where I could actually disengage the, the, um, the wall, like bring his walls, his walls began to come down. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I could speak some truth and in, in love in those spaces kindly, and he could actually hear it. And assuring him that I loved him, but I didn't like his, the behavior and that I would have to, you know, we'd have to work on the behavior side and there'd be some consequences to that. But it was, it was kind of a remarkable space for us, even as a family to be able to switch into that kind of mode of, uh, correction, if you would say, or just being able to talk about literally what had happened. And that was a significant moment for us in parenting and and just learning how to actually really do it when it comes into an intense situation yeah yeah that's awesome not awesome that you had to go through the situation but awesome right that God used it uh -huh. i agree <laughs> <laughs> um the, one of the things that you were talking about there that that um i think is really profound when we talk about speaking truth is speaking true identity over people mm. absolutely that, that and the and the phrasing you used that was really cool was this idea that this is not who you are this is not who i know you to be mm -hmm. it's it's incongruent it's inconsistent with the truth and that's really what falsehood is it's anything that's not consistent with the truth right and so when we talk about what's going on in somebody's life and we say no no God didn't call you to a place of poverty. God didn't, you know, whatever the issue is that they're wrestling with. He called you to a place of abundance. Mm -hmm. It may not be a financial abundance, but, but I'm going to speak abundance over your life so that you're not living from the spirit of poverty, right? And there's that, that uh, creating, um, creating consistency between how God sees people. And how they see, how we see them, and how they see themselves, and we become kind of that bridge uh, that allows people to go, "Oh, this is what God thinks about me, really." Right. And and there's, man, if if speaking the truth in love has has a definition, that seems like that's what it would be: telling people who how God really sees them, and how God really feels about them. Um, to we, me, we that's have a like world that. Go ahead. No, we have a world that thinks that God's mad at him. Yeah. And, and if we're carrying Jesus and we're coming across heavy handed on things, we're just exhibiting and, and mm -hmm. exactly what they think God is. And that's right. not who he is. I mean, all we have to really do is go back to the kindness of God towards us. Right. I mean, really, yeah. we all need hum humility checks when it comes mm -hmm. to those places. Where have we come from? And remembering that grace that's over our lives still. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I've got some friends down here. This is a, this is a different breed of peeps down here. Let me tell you. And I love it. Uh, when they say Texas, is, they're like, it's always a culture shock. They're asking you culture shock, culture shock. Culture. And I'm like, yes, yes, but good. I love it. It's good, but I love it. And so, uh, I love gritty people and, and gritty people don't scare me. I would much rather minister to 
someone outside the faith and just fresh coming in than anyone who's been in the faith for so long that they are stuck in their ways, in their religious ways, in their religious thinking. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I've got a few people that I've been absolute blessed that the Lord's brought in my life right now. And it, two of them, I just, I just spoke this the other night to a group of people. One said it one at one time, and then one came around and said it again in another situation. Uh, we're completely culturally different. Um, uh, one's African American, one's Hispanic. Um, but both of them told me, you are the first person that's ever made me feel human. Hmm. And every time I say that, I just want to weep mm -hmm. because somewhere we've missed the mark that anybody in our midst should ever feel anything less than human. And both of them know, and they, they know that I love them right where they're at and right with what's going on with them. And it's, it's okay. I don't have them on a track. I don't have them. They're not a project, but I am their best cheerleader and empowerer. And they allow me to speak truth because they know I love them and they feel safe in it. They feel like they, they feel like they can finally breathe and they can see places where they need to go. It's, there's no reason for Andrea and I, to, or you, Eric, to point out the obvious to anyone. Right. They already know their crap. Yes. Yes. But they're looking for a way out of it and introducing them to the person of Jesus mm -hmm. is much different than, than introducing them to a set of rules to follow. Yeah. Yeah. It's the difference between orthodoxy and truth, right? Yeah. Orthodoxy is we want you to live by a certain set of rules or beliefs or, or whatever. Truth is I want to introduce you to Jesus because, mm -hmm. because what Jesus has done for me, I know he can do for you. What Jesus yeah. has done for so many over the years, I know he can do. And it's, it, and it's again, that, that idea that it moves from being something that's just a knowing more about Jesus. No, no, no. Let me tell you who he is. Not just about him, but who he's been to me. And, and, and there's just power in that. Um, and truth, right? You said earlier, Stephanie, and it, it... All right, well... So you didn't get to participate in our conversation with Andrea and uh, Stephanie on Love and Truth. Right. Um, so actually, I'm kind of, it, it makes me more interested in your thoughts because <laughs> you weren't here. Uh -huh. than, I mean, not that I'm not interested when you are a part of the conversation, but I can kind of anticipate sure. uh, when you've been a part of the conversation, uh, how that's going to go. So um, I, I am curious to hear from you now. What maybe was one thing that you're like, okay, that really stands out to me from this from this part. So I really appreciated when they brought the um, illustration of family and teenagers. Yeah. Um, we, that is something we all can connect with, that there is this um, rules versus relationship, um, sometimes tension, that if we have rules without relationship, it's just going to, it's not going to work. Um, and there is this concept where, um, and I appreciate what Stephanie said when she gave the, the insight into something that happened in her family. And she, she basically saying, this is not who you are. Yeah. But it was based on relationship. It was that love that she assured that was always going to be there. That this love is not conditional. The love is not based upon what you do and whether you please me or not. That the foundation was this agape, unconditional love. Out of that then flows identity. And then from identity, um, and, and it was interesting as I was listening, was really coming into relationship and saying, I am missing something. I, I feel like I, 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 something's not connecting with me. And that <clears throat> truth is not about a cultural expression, rules and regulations. Truth is about who you are yeah. and made in the image of God. And bringing it back to that, um, yes, we definitely don't want to see people continue 
to make decisions that will be self-sabotaging as well as self-destructive. And, th and there may be a time in someone's life where we need to um, grab them away from the precipice and pull them back just for their own good. That's not the majority at right. all of the situations that we face. Most of it is more of people are looking for a, a place of to be belong, mm -hmm. accepted, and understood. Right. And then now taking it from Jesus' perspective, um, you know, we like to jump into the, the, the places where Jesus confronts, yeah. you know, the hypocrisy or he confronts the, the things that are wrong. But if you read the context of when that may come about, it's always within he develops the relationship. He expresses right. the value of the person he's engaging with. And even those that we consider the greatest uh, enemies, which would be the religious leaders, he still valued who they were. Um, and so, one, it's that love yeah. that then um, allows a person to feel safe and vulnerable, which then gives them permission to be authentic with where they're at. And then we, then we just share ourselves. Right. Again, not a, not a rule or regulation. We share ourselves. And so it, it comes down to relationship as well. So that, I mean, it was just a very encouraging. Um, I appreciated it. But you know what the most frustrating thing then is? You know, I, came, I would say, okay, if I was trying to bring across the point, it takes too long. Right, it's a, it's a long process. Oh, yeah. So right? so yeah, the meant. relational right, right. a relation building a relationship right. is a much longer process than just going you're exactly. wrong and I'm right exactly. here's why. Yeah. yeah. Because we want to see people flourish. Right. And so but if it's going to be this long-term process of relationship but see this is the other thing that I heard you say and others say was we're People don't want to be a project. Yeah. And so I had a lot of thoughts in this. And in fact, it was funny because I was listening to it. I was going, oh, I got a question. Oh, I got a question. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to somehow jump in. <laughs> so for me, it was just coming back to that very uh, sincere, authentic desire to say, you're important to me. Right. And though we may disagree, you're still incredibly important yeah. to me in my life. And you bring value to my life. And and those moments you mentioned earlier where, where you may have to jump in and grab somebody and pull them back from the precipice don't then flow from a from a place of I want to be right. Yes. <laughs> it's, yeah. But they flow, flow from, from a place of, oh no. Right, exactly. I don't want to lose you. Right, exactly. And it's it's when we begin to value being with people. Mm -hmm more than we value them doing the right things. Right. That we, we know that, okay, I'm, I'm coming from a place of love. Mm -hmm. Which, again, one of the things that I felt um, very strongly as we were having that conversation was, was this idea of um, they're not... That the law, what Paul said about the law, the law was powerless. Yep. What the law was powerless to do in the flesh, the spirit of love brought power to. Absolutely. So for the, for the first time, transformation could take place, not because I knew what the right thing. Let's, let's be real honest. Deep down inside, even people who think they're doing the right thing but are actually doing the wrong thing know they're doing the wrong thing. We know we're messed up. I know I'm messed up. You know you're messed up. We all know where our mistakes are and where our failures are. And if we're not sure yet, we will be soon because we're going to experience that. You know, right. th there's this component of, do I really need to point out your flaws? Absolutely not, because I already know them very well. Probably better than me, <laughs> right? And so that's, that's the law, what pointing out flaws doesn't bring about transformation. It's the spirit of love mm -hmm. that brings about yes. transformation. And what are we really after? Uh, that, that was one of the things we talked about there, was that, man, if, you, if you're coming at 
speaking the truth from this place of moral authority mm -hmm. that, man, you, you uh, are living a lifestyle that I don't agree with, and it needs to change. And I'm going to convince you to change. And somehow my logic and my reason and my rules and my regulations actually work to change your behavior. All I really did was force you to comply right. with my way of life. Mm -hmm. When what I really want to do is invite you into a transformational yes. experience with Jesus Christ. And those two things are not the same. No, they're not. And I think the church, by and large, over the years has conflated the two. Yes. Rather than pursuing transformation with a recognition, recognition that when people are transformed in their heart, the behaviors will follow. Amen. So really, it comes down to, my thought is, we, when we have a perspective of moral authority <clears throat> and those things, we're trying to convert people to an ism. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a lot of isms that are more, more efficient and effective than other isms um, based upon your personality type uh, and just the culture that you live in. Jesus is not an ism. Yeah. Right? And so truth in, in our context of our culture is a kind of ism. But as you've stated frequently in conversations not just limited to here but reminding us consistently truth is a person and not an ism yeah so that's really what um it's it's removing ourselves or at least doing our best to deconstruct as a concept that truth is a set of principles and axioms it's a person yeah and admittedly so, in my limited way of thinking, in my limited experience, um, I do believe in my, in my limited understanding that the choices that I've made are most effective for me. So therefore, because they're most effective for me, guess what? If you do it, what I do and how I do it, and when I do it, they're going to be effective for you too, right? So we've turned Christianity sometimes into a how-to yeah. rather than... Uh, an invitation rather than a who exactly yeah. so th that is to me one of the the founding um uh, or root issues of speaking and uh, well understanding and then speaking what we call truth yeah. uh, in love and, and i appreciated that because i do I, I you said something in the podcast that i totally agree with too when i hear speaking truth in love not only do i cringe I think of what I call the bludgeoning scriptures yeah. that people use as the go-to to tell you how bad you are, how wrong you are, how right we are. And if you don't think and believe the way we do, guess what? Right. Ultimately, you're going to be bludgeoned by the Lord himself. Yeah. And what both Andrea and Stephanie mentioned was that there's this, as, as soon as you begin to do this whole speaking the truth in love thing, the way we all, always had done it, um, immediately there are walls built up and it becomes, yes. a, Christianity becomes a, a place of exclusion yes. rather than welcome. Exactly. Um, and, and that is so antithetical yes. to who Christ is yep. that it's antichrist. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, what I'm, and I'm going to say, and actually, I'm, let me just put a nuance under that anti yes in the sense of another Christ. Yeah, right. right? Now it works against right the yeah. the goal of union in Christ, but we present uh, another type of Christ that does not, not bring him. people in. Exactly, it's not truth. Exactly, amen. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. and the life. Amen. And so there's there's this. Um, just that, again, when we talk about the Christic covenant and shifting, shifting our mindsets and finding those places where the old covenant has still got its roots in us, this is one of those areas, this desire to get everyone to follow our, our principles mm -hmm. rather than to follow Jesus. Yes. And, and that's, that's that shift that we've got to get in our mind that, man, I have got to separate the actions mm -hmm. From, from the heart, amen. from the reality. Their actions, and this is what Stephanie was saying about her son or, or mm -hmm. whatever, 
their actions do not reflect who they truly are. Yes. In Christ. Mm -hmm. And so anything that I am speaking to them from, from that place of love and, and true relationship is going to be affirming who I know them to be in Christ. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to focus as heavily on, well, that's not right, and that's not right, and this isn't right, and you need to change this. Instead, I'm going to be saying, I love this about you. Mm -hmm. And identifying the things that God has placed in, I mean, I don't care who the person is, there is something in them that God put in them yes. that is worth loving and valuing and, and calling out. And so, and there, there are other things that God is going to, uh, that are going to come to fruition in their lives. Mm -hmm. And and when we call those out, man, and and I hear I hear it a lot in in like pop psychology and stuff. Oh, you got you know the whole positivity thing and 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 whatever. And that's not really what we're talking about here. No. And, and and I want to draw a distinction there Good. because it, because it can it can very easily become a thing where you're like, well, I'm only going to say not, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all, right? That's that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about honestly and and with the power of the Holy Spirit and the mm -hmm. eyes of the of our heart enlightened, looking at someone and going, man, I see this in mm -hmm. your life that God has put there. Yep. And I want to bless that. Mm -hmm. There's a prophetic nature mm -hmm. to it. Absolutely. That I think um, is lacking from speaking mm -hmm. the truth in love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I guess that's what I would say, mm -hmm. is that when, when we're truly operating in this the way that Paul intended and the way that Jesus intended when they talked about this, we're operating from that this, this, a, a spirit of love and prophecy that is so different than simply calling out people's yes. wrongness. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I look forward to where the rest of the discussion mm -hmm. goes. I don't know, you got any last thoughts that you want to? I just want to put a punctuation point on all that you've said and what I'm hearing Stephanie and Andrea said, which actually ties into the previous podcasts, which is, again, it's coming out of union uh, with Christ, that we are one in Christ. We see from his perspective. Um, this is yeah. something that we are building precept upon precept. So it's that union that we ourselves then um, see from his perspective how we're created in his image, how then others are created in his image. And it's out of that relationship of the father and the son, that love that we experience, we're transformed by that love. And then we really can then become the very expression of love to those around us. Um, and so I just want to uh, just remind us that we're, 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 connecting all of these podcasts yeah. um and it's really again like i said precept upon precept as we move forward in this and so uh i think this conversation really demonstrates a practical outflow of what we're talking about with um bill vanderbush so amen well again thank you for joining us mm -hmm. and we look forward to the next time uh, if you've got questions, comments, please let us know. Uh, you can reach us through the Trinity Church website at www.trinitychurchmorton.org. And we'd be happy to respond to any questions, comments, thoughts that you've got about our podcasts. If you'd like to be notified of upcoming uh, podcasts that are going to be released, please click the like and subscribe, and that will notify you anytime we're releasing a new one. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.